This is The Corner Table, a podcast about food and drink in Madison, Wisconsin, produced by the Capital Times. I'm Lindsay Christians. And I am Chris Lay. Last time you heard from us was this past spring with our series Reopening Sardine. If, for whatever reason, you missed that, you should absolutely go back and check it out. We're breaking our hiatus because not only do I have some very exciting news, we also have some audio related to that good news that we wanted to share. The big news is the release of Lindsay's book titled Madison Chefs, Stories of Food, Farms, and People. It's a collection of nine profiles of local luminaries, along with 28 recipes and well over 100 color photographs by Chris Hines. It is now available wherever fine books are sold. We celebrated the release with an in-person Q&A at the wonderful Leopold's Books Bar Cafe, which was moderated by my co-host, Chris. What follows is the audio from that chat, which was captured on the fly by a phone that I was balancing on my notes. So while it is absolutely audible, let's just say that it is rustic. We'll include links in the show notes for where you can buy the book, uh, the Cap Times cover story, highlighting the introduction and any other relevant stuff that you would do very well to click on. Give a listen. Check, check. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Leopold's. Happy Tuesday. Happy solstice. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's the solstice. Welcome. Uh, I'm Molly. I'm the bookstore manager here, and I'm very happy to introduce Lindsay Christians, author of Madison Chefs. Published author as of today, Lindsay Christians. We're very excited. This book is for sale up front here. So please come purchase a copy and Lindsay will be happy to sign it for you later. And I'm going to introduce Lindsay's podcast partner and co-host this evening for our little program, Chris Lay. Here's Chris. Hello. So going to be fitting, like shallow. Um, Yeah, Lindsay is Madison's premier food writer. She was my editor for the handful of articles that I wrote for the Cap Times, uh, the most popular of which was... Local lawnmowers rank lawnmower beers. Ow. I remember that. Yeah. And yeah. So Lindsay is just absolutely fantastic. Everyone here has discovered new restaurants through her, developed a better understanding and appreciation of established restaurants through her features and cover stories. And if you've been lucky enough to hang out with her in person, you have been bowled over by her bottomless well of effervescence. (laughs) So, I'm really excited to be here asking a bunch of questions of Lindsay Christians, the author of Madison Chefs, Stories of Food Farms and People. Yay, thank you. You're very welcome. (laughs) So, I wanted to start off by asking a pretty intense, big question. Doing journalism, you have had to wear, you know, pretty solid journalistic hats. Mm. And writing this book has been different than that. It has. So how did you juggle those different things? Okay, I I think I can respond to that. I'm going to wrap you up in this cord here. Can everybody hear us okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Hi. Um, So yeah, I trained as a journalist, and I still am one at the Cap Times. And when you, first of all, when you do that kind of work, you are used to writing something and then seeing it the next day, or, you know, in a couple days. And you get pretty quick feedback, and you... You learn fast that way. This was a much longer process, but I couldn't write it not like a journalist, right? I had to write it like the writer that I am, Um, which meant a lot of interviews. So I interviewed not only the chefs, but also the cooks that they worked with, and in some cases, their parents, and in many cases, their mentors, and you know the guy who you know does the garden out back and the <laughs> farmers that they work with and um, you know the farmers around the square that they're most familiar with and I just talked to I mean gosh a hundred plus people for this book like so many people and it was really fun 
but I also had, it was very hard to figure out when now was. Like, when is now? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm reporting this book in the fall of 2017. Um, and I know that it's not going to come out for a while. We thought for a while it was going to come out in fall of 2020, but the editors wisely at UW Press said, no one's going to be talking about anything but the election in 2020. <laughs> so, it didn't come out then. Um, so, but actually, the wonderful, wonderful thing? No, that's wrong. The thing about the pandemic is that it, it made when is now much clearer. So I, there was like this strong break that made this a recent history instead of a work of contemporary journalism. It's still a little bit of both, right? But I could use past tense and feel okay about using past tense because it felt like some things had passed. So yeah, that was one of the big differences. And another one too is I made really deliberate decisions. I, I found out so much stuff about everybody in this book and I made really conscious, deliberate decisions of what to leave in and what to leave out. Yeah. So. And I'm not going to ask you to no. spill those <laughs> yes, beans. I'm not going to. No, no, no. And that's, I mean, you have had to cover in the page of the Cap Times some of these subjects very critically. Mm. And that's not what this book is about. Mm. It's about, you know, painting rounded and you know complex portraits but not about you know i mean like doing hit pieces or anything like that. Right, yeah. <laughs> so who was it that surprised you the most with the things that you learned over the course of reporting this book that's really hard um a lot of them surprised me in a lot of different ways i mean so dan is here but we <laughs> went out to his pig farms and he can tell um the qualities of different breeds of pigs by looking at them, even if they're crosses, which is amazing. Also, pigs in the winter are like in a big pile so they can stay warm, <laughs> which is amazing. And you can see like random, like waddles on some of them and like different characteristics of different ones. And it, just, it was, that was fascinating. I was freezing my butt off. It was so cold. I, I thought maybe I would never warm up again, but I did. Um, but that was really fun. That was a surprise. I'd never been to a pig farm before, let alone in the middle of January, uh, where the Amish folks on the farm were still like hanging their clothes on the clothesline, which, how do they get dry? Anyway, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so that was, that was fun. I went around the farmer's market with Francesca Hong and she had her baby carriage with no baby in it. And we just like put a bunch of like squash and onions and scallions and blah, blah, blah in the square. And she was telling me like, okay, so this leg of the farmer's market is more expensive because of where it is like off of that Stella's corner, right? So like there's certain areas of the farmer's market where like you'll see the prices for the same things be higher. Who knew? Uh, I didn't. So things like that. Um, but there were a lot of things. There were a lot of things I found out I love talking to people's parents. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, there's a Ted Lasso quote recently where he's like, it's like, all the, it's like a roadmap to all the reasons they're crazy. Um, <laughs> which is kind of true. Um, so that was fun. Uh, I feel like I learned a lot from being physically in the kitchen, which is so much fun. And if you are like reviewing restaurants in a, the most traditional sense, you never get to go in the kitchen. I love going in the kitchen. It's so much fun. And you learn so much about how they work and all the little tricks about how like you can start risotto and then finish it later. Didn't know that. Like, I'm not sure if you're supposed to, but whatever. <laughs> like, there were a lot of things like that that, I, that surprised me along the way. It's my favorite part. Um, there are people in this room that I talked to about how much fun I was having during that time. And uh, my friend wisely told me to remember that when it got hard later. Which it did. So, <laughs> yay, writing fun. Excellent. So you mentioned Francesca, mm -hmm. and in this book, you uh, you have Francesca, mm -hmm. and you also have Tammy Lax. Yes. But there are no other women chefs in here, and I was intrigued by that, and didn't know if you want to talk about 
why there aren't more and elaborate on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that is something I've written about many times over the years about sort of uh, Madison's comparative lack of women in executive chef positions and in restaurant tour positions. And I think it has to do with systemic things like generational wealth and support and the number of, number of women who leave the workforce or um, have a moderated career because of children, right? It's because of all of those things. And that is part of the reason we don't see more female executive chefs and we don't see more you know, female restaurateurs, just because the amount of time, it, and not even just time, but like the amount of money and support that you need to really lead your own place and ha like make your creative dreams come true um, is just extraordinary. Um, I was asked in an interview recently about the difference between Madison's restaurant scene like 10 years ago and now. And I think that there are a lot of the same pressures. But one thing I, I keep thinking about is all of the amazing, wonderful ideas that people are still having that are harder to execute now because there aren't as many people to work. Um, the staffing issues are continually getting just harder, right? We've been writing about that and reading about that. Um, so you're seeing restaurants close more days a week. You're seeing hours being shortened. You're seeing menus being shortened too because ingredient costs go up, right? There's still all these pressures that we had before that seem to have been amplified. Um, so, so yeah, that's part of it. It was really important to me to have, you know, some diversity represented in the book, but that's a, there are structural things that I think we're still working to change. Yeah. One of my favorite things about the book is that it is loaded with recipes. Yep. And you had to test all of these recipes. Yeah. So I'm just going to hand the microphone back to you <laughs> and let you talk about that. Y'all, math. Math is real. Um, I am not, I don't think I'm math illiterate. Really? But like, I love to cook. And testing recipes is not cooking. It's not the same. It's different. You have to you have to not only make a, a recipe work that went from a a chef's kitchen, right, where they have different resources and different amounts of time and different skills, to a home cook, and you have to not only like pare down the amounts of things that you're making. Thank you, Gwen, for doing that. <laughs> I think you did the sausage, right? Yeah. yeah. So Gwen was one of my recipe testers. We, um, she tested cake, and you tested a bunch of things. Um, yes. We, I, t I retested some things. I, there's only one recipe in the book that nobody has tested, and that is the burrata. If you make the burrata, you are on your own. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick DePula called for five pounds of mozzarella curd or whatever, and you need to have like seven gloves and super hot water. And I was like, I'm gonna buy five pounds of mozzarella. No, I won't do it. They, they, they do sell it for bonies, FYI. Um, I can tell you where to get everything. But there were, there were a lot of things where like, I'm, I'm at four quarter, like everything is about like taking things from this food chat and then like transforming them. So you have like black garlic and smoked apples and all kinds of fun things. I would smoked apples in my backyard. <laughs> learned about that. Um, I learned to make a strudel. I pickled mustard seeds. There are so many cool techniques in this book, and I did test them all. And I tried to explain, like in the head notes, like, you're going to have some extra pickled mustard seeds, and here's what you can maybe do with them, because here's what I did with them. <laughs> you know? So I am not saying I never want to test recipes again. Um, I've learned a lot from testing recipes. It's not. It's not the same as cooking. That's what I want to say. <laughs> Do you have a favorite recipe? Do you have a favorite recipe in the book? Oh, I mean, there's a white fish dish that's one of Dan's. It's amazing. Um, it's got like a curry sauce to it. And I also really love the red cabbage. I just love red cabbage um, with a spetzel, which was very delicious. That's with like a pork schnitzel. It's really good. Um, but he makes it better. Um, <laughs> I really loved, I really loved making the like Wisco Korean bibimbap that 
Tori has in the book, that's really good. And the kohlrabi salad that's in there that was from Sucho, that was one of the recipes that I was like, I don't care what else is in this book, I need to have this kohlrabi salad recipe because I'm obsessed with it. And I couldn't find the dried shrimp for it because I thought I was looking for a dried thing. But if you go to the Asian market, the dried shrimp are in the fridge. And then I brought them home and I realized it expired. So I, anyway, it was a whole thing. But that is delicious. Check the expiration dates. Do you have any predictions for 2022? Anything that people should be looking for? Any like up and coming chefs that anybody, any names you want to drop that maybe aren't out there being covered? Or what do you think? I mean, I think things are, I mean, we have a wonderful collection of food writers in this town that do an amazing job. We are many voices and it's wonderful. Um, I really loved Lady Bird dinner parties over at Cassetta um, on Saturday nights. Those are cool. That's Nick Lark, I want to say, and Shauna. They're doing really cool stuff over there. Um, obviously, the Harvey House is incredible. Go to the Harvey House. It's beautiful. Um, and, and there's technique on the plate that I can't explain, uh, which is always fun to be like, oh, they spent like 18 hours in this demi glass. I don't know exactly what they did. I really love the energy coming out of the PNP Make Shop, the Pasture and Plenty folks over on like near west here. They're doing some really cool stuff. And I think. One of the things that makes Madison's food scene really cool and exciting is you can have a lot of that energy coming out of um, like food carts and other small businesses like that. So like you have somebody like, um, oh, Patrick over at Lombardino's at Halloran, who's doing the delicious, are these beautiful spice blends. That was a pandemic thing that happened, but I feel like that's kind of where creativity comes in sometimes now. It's like things that like, like Lady Bird, that don't have a huge barrier to entry. Like you're not, having a big pop-up thing. Um, I'm excited for the supper club that the Settle Down dudes are gonna do, this cranberry club thing they've been talking about. I think I called it the cranberry supper club and Sam wrote to me and was like, it's not that, it's called <laughs> cranberry club, I, whatever. I think I put a supper in there and I shouldn't have. Um, that's another thing about the difference between writing journalism and writing a book. Like when people, like when you get something wrong, which you inevitably will, people will tell you, immediately but this I had to write and then sit on and then edit and then write and then sit on and edit and whatever and so who knows what's wrong in there I mean I triple checked stuff and I like went back and I found things in the archive that were wrong and repeated wrong which is horrifying so yeah like my shoulders are going to go down at some point but they're not down yet yeah I didn't know, is there anybody here that has a question for Lindsay? We can open the floor up and... So how did this become like a, a, a I don't know, a zygote in your brain? You know? Oh! How did this become a zygote in your brain? <laughs> I hope I used that correctly. I have no idea. <laughs> Sounds like a science word, I wouldn't know it. Um, how, how did you conceive of this idea? I didn't. It was uh, the idea of Raphael Kadushan at UW Press. He was the former executive editor. He's a, he's a travel writer and food writer himself. He was supposed to be here tonight, but he's still in New York until the 23rd. Um, but I met Raphael at a uh, food writer panel thing that we did in like the spring of 2017 uh, with Michelle Wilgen and Melissa Clark, and it was really cool. And uh, he reached out a few months later and he said, I had this idea for this book, which would be like a profile of like four chefs and they would all write their own stories. <laughs> and that didn't work. <laughs> Gwen's laughing because she knows why. Uh, people are busy, people have lives. And like writing this much is a lot. Um, so he reached out and he said, would you be interested in doing it? And I said, yes, but I would wanna do it my way. Like, frame it the way I want to frame it, do it the way I want to do it. So um, they said yes. And Chris Hines, who's the photographer on this project, who did a beautiful job, she had already signed on. She was interested in doing it. So she was already part of the project, and then I signed on to do it. And I did a bunch of research in the fall of 2017, and then I procrastinated for six months or so and just quietly freaked out. And then... <laughs> 
<laughs> and like took a lot of other assignments and did freelance work and and then I finally buckled down in mid 2018 to write. So I did write some in the spring of 2018, but for the most part, I was like, <gasps> books. <laughs> Because they're forever. If you look around, they, they look like their books look like they're forever. Journalism is like fish wrap, you know? It's like the next morning it's in the birdcage. You know? That's a good analogy. Right? <laughs> yeah. I'm used to that quick turnover. And and when you have something that's like gonna yeah. live, I love I love the archive. We share that love. We both love the archive. <laughs> I, there's a bunch of random stuff in there. And it's great and I love spending time in that history, but knowing that my work was gonna be a part of it was really intimidating. I think that's part of why it took me so long. So, obviously you've mentioned, you've talked a little bit about, like, these are people that you cover on a day-to-day -day basis, people that you have to interact with as sources, as your subjects all the time. Um, without getting into maybe any specifics for individual chefs or anything that you decided not to put into the book, what are insights that you gain from covering these chefs or from a book perspective, from getting this much broader, what did you learn about them as people that you can learn about them what did you learn about these subjects, covering them from a book perspective versus covering them from a journalistic perspective? You really just made that short and sweet. Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't have to, you know, yeah. you, you knocked out the first draft. <laughs> um, every, every one of the chefs who's, who's featured in this book is a huge risk taker. And part of success is failure. I think we all kind of intellectually know that, even if we aren't allowed, or if we don't grant ourselves that every time. Um, but just the amount of risks they took and the amount of ways they came back from those failures in, uh, in different ways, right? Um, some of them happened during the reporting of the book and I had to go back and re-interview people and be like, this is a major thing, I can't not mention this. What have you learned, how have you grown? Um, so that, that was one, just seeing the risks that they took, not only with like their money, but also their bodies and their time and their families. It is to achieve anything um, has cost, right? And so I think I learned more about that cost. I will also say, like, because I was going into kitchens and spending a lot of time at restaurants during a time when they weren't slammed and busy and they weren't taking my order right then, right? That's how I was able to source the story I wrote in 2018 about the Me Too movement in restaurants, which was a really hard story to write. It was a fantastic story. Thank you. It, that was not an easy piece. Uh, that's not a piece I hope to have to do again, although I would. Um, but that came from long sits, just hanging out. and and meeting people and talking to people and building trust, which is, I think, what our business is about, right? No. So, yeah, I think I learned mostly about risk. Anybody else? What were a couple of your most memorable flavors that you tasted? What were some of your most <laughs> memorable flavors that you tasted? Didn't have to touch that one up at all. I mean, <laughs> I mean the smoked apples for sure were cool. Uh, I really liked the smoked apples. <laughs> I made my own ramen as part of this book. Wow. So I had to get all these bones like from the conscious carnivores, <laughs> like chicken feet and pork legs and feet, like actual pork feet <laughs> they put in a big pot. Like it was a whole thing. It took a very long time. Um, I, lo I love, my ramen was good, but like buy your ramen. <laughs> <laughs> Just buy it. <laughs> the horse does it really well. Um, so that was cool though. And also, I learned that like the tare that they use for ramen, like to the base of flavor, you can put that in all kinds of stuff. <laughs> uh, like any broth, it makes it amazing. Um, so that was fun. I feel like, like I was out at Garden to Be with Gil Alchel, who's in the book. He, we were out with his dog Carl, and we're like running around a Garden to Be, and Carl is an adorable, very good dog. Um, he's a very good dog. Um, but we were out, like, running around at Garden to Bee, and, and Scott, who's the farmer there, Scott Williams, was, like, pulling microgreens off of just his flats of things. And also, you could, like, look around the greenhouse, and you could see where he dropped stuff, and it just grew on the floor, of the, well, I guess in the ground of the greenhouse. 
but that was really cool because you can taste, it tastes, a lot of these microgreens, we know, like they taste different. They taste like cilantro, but not, or they taste like sunflowers, but not. Um, but he had such a range of them in there, and it was really cool to taste that kind of intense flavor. It's such a delicate thing. That was cool. Katie. Do you think the experience changed your perceptions or your process as a reporter as a result? This is my editor, Katie, asking me <laughs> um, if I am changed as a reporter uh, because of this process. Uh, maybe, yeah. <laughs> so I, I've always sort of been aware that like when you are writing critically about something, you have to do so with thought and care and like triple fact checking and all this stuff. Like I already knew that. But this book feels like this thing that I have been working on for years that I like put my heart and soul and blood into, right? And when a chef opens a restaurant, that is something they've been working on for years that they put their heart and soul and blood into as well. It feels like I, I have a parallel that I didn't before. It has been hard to go back to restaurant criticism in the way that I used to do it, which is not to say the way I used to do it was wrong or bad. Um, but it takes a lot, I want a lot of context. I want a lot of context. I want a lot of background and I want to understand, like I feel, I feel complicated commenting about service right now because everything is so tight and they've just been through hell, you know? So I, uh, yeah, a little bit. I don't, I don't know if I think it's made me a better or worse reporter, but I do, think that it's an empathy like practice and just like I've always said that Madison is my city. I live here. I care about this place. I'm invested in this place. I want it to be the best version of itself that it can be. I still feel that way. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think now the book is out like as of today. So I think maybe <laughs> Things will start to, to make themselves clear to me as more people have thoughts and feelings about it that I don't know what they will be, right? But I, I like criticize myself every little step of the way as well, which I do less a bit with my journalistic work, right? But now I think I'm doing a little bit more, so I don't know if it makes me a better reporter or not. So, eh. Speaking about the, the restaurateurs and mm. you know, wait staff and everything, uh, going through hell, I, would be remiss if I didn't plug our Reopening Sardine yeah. podcast series that we did this past spring. They gave us a tremendous amount of access. And if anybody has not listened to that, go back. It's the six most recent, I guess, episodes of The Corner Table. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Sign up for The Corner Table. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. So how did making the book with the pandemic affect the book? And then also predictions going forward. So the book was fully drafted by January 2020. Like it was a full draft, I was done. Yeah, ish. So I had already gone through one, one round of edits and I'd gotten all my comments back from amazing readers. Um, uh, Tanaya Darlington was one of my readers and Mary Bergen was the other one. So they are both amazing food writers. And, so wonderful. Um, and Therese Allen was a, a great help in the book as well. So the pandemic kind of happened at a time when I already mostly had the book drafted and then I had a lot of extra time to think about it and edit it more. So I cut more out of it. I think I wrote like 75,000 words and I had to cut it to 60 and then I like cut it even further from there. And I took out stuff that I really liked, but it's tighter because of that. So I mean, I think we all had COVID furloughs in like the spring of 2020, and I took some of that time to edit it. But for the most part, like all of the reporting was done. Um, but the, the main difference that you'll see is that at the end of my introduction, I was able to reference, we are currently in a pandemic, who knows what's gonna be next. 
but we might have some hope for the future. Now, in terms of the future and looking forward, I think that we will see more focus on ingredients in terms of like not only cost, but I think we'll, we'll I think we're going to start seeing shorter menus, and we've already have been. Um, the restaurants that I've seen open, like since, etc., um, have had shorter menus for I think good reasons. Um, I think we'll start to see some different business models, right? Um, and I hope, I mean, I'm going to come back to empathy, but I hope we see more compassion and empathy for the people who do this work and more valuing of them because they have historically been <laughs> paid pretty low wages for long hours and hard work. And I think that we need to learn to, I don't know, respect that, respect that labor a little bit more. So I hope, I hope these are the things that we'll see. I'm not a fortune teller, but. Thank you so much to Lindsay and Chris. And again, her book, Madison Chefs, is for sale. Make a great holiday present for anyone in your life who has been to a Madison restaurant. This has been The Corner Table, a podcast about food and drink in Madison, Wisconsin, produced by the Capital Times. It is recorded and produced by Chris Lay and me, Lindsay Christians. Patrick Christians composed our music. We aren't exactly sure when we're going to be back with new episodes or any limited series, but the best way to guarantee that you will get them whenever we get around to dropping them is to subscribe to the show on your podcast player of choice. Once you're subscribed, check out the archives and rate and review and share and all that other good stuff. If you want more Madison Chef's content, follow us on Instagram at Madison Chef's Book, where I'm dropping lots of photos that did not make the book. And I have an event coming up at Mystery to Me Bookstore on February 2nd with Francesca Hong. That'll be over Zoom and it'll be free. And buy Lindsay's fantastic book, Madison Chef's Stories of Food, Farms, and People. I am Lindsay Christians. And I am Chris Light. Our wish for you this week is some Morris ramen. You can make it yourself. There's a recipe in the book or you can just go to Morris and buy it because it's so delicious and so much easier. That sounds absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.